she drew a sketch just right there and then that uh, became one of my most treasured possessions. <laughs> and I showed it to this young filmmaker, a guy named uh, Steven Spielberg. And uh, I had never heard of him. I was, hope he's doing okay with his career now. But It's tough out there. Hello and welcome to Reality Studies, a show that tries to clarify the chaos from culture to the cosmos. I'm your host, Jesse Damiani. Each episode, I sit down with leading thinkers for big idea dialogues about the research, concepts, and questions that animate their approaches to reality. Joining me today are Leah Halloran and Kip Thorne, authors of the forthcoming book, The Warped Side of Our Universe, an odyssey through black holes, wormholes, time travel, and gravitational waves. Leah is an award-winning artist who has exhibited widely in galleries and museums. She's also chair of the Department of Art and associate professor at Chapman University. She lives with her wife and two children in Los Angeles, California. Kip is a Nobel Prize winning physicist and the Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics Emeritus at Caltech. He is also the author of the best-selling books, Black Holes and Time Warps and The Science of Interstellar. He lives with his wife in Pasadena, California. Hello, we are talking about the warp side of our universe with Leah Halloran and Kip Thorne. Leah and Kip, thank you for being on Reality Studies. Thanks for inviting us. We're super excited to be here, Jesse. There's a lot to talk about with this book, and I'm excited to get to all of it, but I feel like the, the place that we need to start is the role of collaboration, because this book feels like a deeply integrated, multidisciplinary book. It doesn't feel like a book that was just, uh, I send you one thing, you send me one thing back. So I'd love if we could start there and kind of go deeper. I'm glad it feels that way, because that's the way we <laughs> tried to craft it, and we worked down hard to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think that was actually the, our biggest fear is that it would look like um, at the end our intentions of trying to create something that actually didn't exist before, that you would open this and that the images and the prose that they equally lifted each other and kind of created a third thing. So the collaboration was really driving the output of the entirety of the book. So from the beginning, that was really what we were going for. So I'm glad that you, you know, highlighted that as, um, you know, the kind of start of our, our um, conversation. Um, should we talk about how we started? Please. Working on this? <laughs> okay, I'll start because it, it starts with me knowing Kip and Kip not knowing me. So it's a good place to start. So, um, well, that's natural since I'm 100 years older than you are. <laughs> Barely. Um, okay, so when I was in graduate school, my mom gifted me a book, uh, which was a book that Kip had written about black holes and time warps, Einstein's outrageous legacy. And this book was so interesting and exciting to me because it was like something that I had like a, an awareness of, an interest in, but when I was reading Kip's book, I felt that the pages transformed into, like I could just envision it and it became embodied, you know, just the way that he would say, what would it be like to travel towards the speed of light? And just the little examples that he would give, I just felt that it was like, it was written in a way that was so welcoming and inviting that for me, I felt that as a personal invitation that I could then translate these larger ideas I was already excited about and then make them into artworks. So with this book and courses in astronomy that I was taking when I was in grad school, and when I, I would, should clarify that I was in grad school for painting. <laughs> um, so, um, I started making paintings that were about black holes and wormholes, and a lot of it was due to being inspired with the the way that Kip wrote. Um, and then fast forward maybe five years later, through some random universal kismet, we ended up at the same cocktail party to celebrate a mutual friend of ours, Lisa Randall, who was um, visiting from Harvard and doing a residency at um, Caltech. Theoretical physicist like me, mm -hmm. not a painter. Yes, not a painter. <laughs> no, no, Lisa's one of the great mm -hmm. uh, physicists of this era. Yeah, and um, so I was at this cocktail party, and I, I actually just overheard someone say um, something, something, Kip Thorne, and my ears perked up, and I was like, Kip Thorne is here? And so I, um, I had no chill at all. I'm pretty sure I was just like, 
I love you. I mean, that probably wasn't my enter entrance sentence, but it must have been the second thing I maybe said was just how influential his book had been. And I invited him over for a studio visit. Um, and he said to me, uh, well, there's a young filmmaker who's interested in making a film about my science, and I'd love help visualizing some of these warped parts of the universe. Um, maybe you can help me. And, and I, so amazingly, she drew a sketch just right there and then that uh, became one of my most treasured possessions, <laughs> and I showed it to this young filmmaker, a guy named uh, Steven Spielberg. And uh, I had never heard of him. I was, hope he's doing okay with his career now. But It's tough out there. Yeah. And so anyway, it, it was my entree to explaining about uh, black holes and wormholes for filmmakers, first Spielberg, and uh, then with Christopher Nolan, uh, as I uh, moved from one uh, filmmaker to another that I, I was collaborating with. Yeah, and that little film turned out to be Interstellar. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it could have, I guess it could have just ended there that we enjoyed meeting each other. We, you know, developed a friendship. But what happened in those early meetings or early kind of coffees was that Kip would come and just sort of blow my mind. And I would sort of, I, I always remember, I thought every time you'd leave, I don't know if I ever told you this, I would feel like my head would get hot. <laughs> <was just> like <laughs> so she started bringing her students, her art students, over to Caltech to talk. And so we'd ha I'd have a conversation with them about the, the science that uh, they were then thinking about drawing uh, paintings of. But then I was uh, invited to do a article for Playboy magazine. And in the era when Playboy was trying to distinguish itself from other men's magazines by having uh, what they regarded as high-class uh, literature or, or interviews. Uh, and so I w was going to do an article about the warp side of the universe, and I uh, told them, well, I would like to do it in collaboration with Leah Halloran, the paint uh, painter. She's a superb painter. I have some experience of uh, 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 working with her. And they uh, they took a look, the art director at, at Playboy, and. And the, uh, and the literature, her editor at Playboy, took a look at uh, her paintings. They were enthusiastic uh, paintings that she had online. And so we signed a contract that we were going to do this. And uh, we produced a wonderful, fabulous article of uh, my prose and uh, what was about five of your paintings. Uh, and when this arrived at uh, Playboy, uh, this guy named Hugh Hefner took a look at the paintings, which had paintings of her girlfriend, now, her, now Leah's wife, and said, this does not look like the iconic Playboy woman. <laughs> and uh, and this, so this is not acceptable. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we told them, well, if you don't like these paintings, then we'll take our kill fee and take the article elsewhere. And, so. and this is one of those learning lessons where you know some sort of like failure or roadblock ends up being absolutely the best thing that could have ever happened um, because it was actually hard even at the 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 beginning and origins of the article to keep it to the word count and the painting count that we wanted every time that we'd get together it would be like oh well maybe we can add a thing and very, very organically, our collaboration started in this way where Kip would say one thing and then he'd come back and I'd say, oh, I produced a couple of paintings. And then he'd look at the paintings and say, oh, that makes me want to add or write something. And so it wasn't that the writing was driving the paintings or the painting was driving the writing. It was like, it was almost outside of us that these two things were sort of having their own organic interaction outside of Kip and I. So we decided almost from the beginning that we would try to turn this into a little book. <laughs> Just a thin little book. Yeah, it yeah. seems pretty little. Yeah. 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 And, and. We said that for 10 years <laughs> until our until our actual publisher had to tell us, you have to stop using it's that word. Little. It's not a little <laughs> book. But anyway, so, so uh, Leah had uh, one of her uh, friends uh, uh, with some talent at this, do a layout of this thing as a book. And uh, she laid the book out and broke some of my prose into stanzas. It was just ordinary science writing prose. Uh, though I had always uh, tried to craft my prose in a way that it rang well and uh, it flowed well. But when she broke it up into some of it on, on two of the pages into stanzas, I looked at it and I said, my gosh, 
that could be a verse. It could be verse. And uh, this epiphany just uh, gradually took hold of me. <clears throat> and that's the point at which we had this vision together that uh, we could produce a book, which is what it turned out to be, of a, a tightly integrated verse and uh, paintings uh, that would, through uh, these two media verse and paintings integrated, would, uh, we would attempt to communicate uh, deep issues in science, the essence of them, uh, these deep, deep issues in science, to a very non-scientific aspect of the public, uh, but, uh, and do it, it, it in a different way than we'd ever done before. But it did seem to me, almost from the beginning, that the, by t making it verse and paintings, that we would be able to convey the essence of the science I'd been doing during my whole career uh, more effectively than with the usual medium of uh, uh, prose, just regular prose and illustrations. Mm -hmm. And, and the, with verse and paintings, it would be much more tightly integrated uh, than if it was a lot of prose and a bunch of illustrations. And so that's what we tried to do, and I think we've succeeded. Yeah, I mean, the, the word that we always came back to and sort of grounded our conversations in was how can we create an experience of the universe? That's really like very, very parallel to how I felt when I read Kip's book, that it was an open invitation. And it was very much our goal to not have a book that was didactic and not have a book that felt like that it was illustrative, but instead you you could kind of have a, it's your own transport system into the curiosities about these things that you would get so excited that you could go on and read more or investigate more, but that this was a distillation of these really complex ideas or things that you would first get the kind of like wow factor of them, mm. and then you could scratch the surface and dig deeper. I mean, Kip, Kip explains a lot in the back. I keep telling him no one's going to read the back, but we'll see. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the few reviews that are out there as yet, the people clearly have read. But the other thing that happened during this, and, and the, from, from the, the beginning of this story until now, is what, about 15 years? So, you yeah. Know, uh, Thir 13, 14. 13, 14 years. Yeah. During those years, uh, the science that I was doing uh, just had huge uh, new insights, huge yeah. changes in our understanding of the universe going on simultaneously. So that a large fraction of the, uh, the stuff in here was about science that didn't exist when we started writing the book. Yeah. Mm. And so the uh, ongoing science got integrated into the book as the science was going on. It was computer simulations of what happens when black holes collide. We'd never had those simulations before. We didn't know how warp space and time behave when black holes are colliding. And these simulations are done by colleagues of mine in something called the SXS collaboration, a superb collaboration of physicists, mostly at Cornell and Caltech, uh, have given us a whole op opened up to us a, a, an understanding of the warped side of the universe that we never had before. Then in parallel, the experimental project called LIGO for searching for gravitational waves from colliding black holes had success, huge success in uh, 2015, uh, and uh, could then begin to test uh, and verify uh, the predictions of the computer simulations. So much of this book, more than half of this book, is about those things that we didn't have, we didn't know, hadn't happened when, when Lee and I began work on the book. So yeah. it's been so exciting. Yeah. And I mean, even with the discovery of the gravitational waves in LIGO, I mean, just think of how profound that is, that we have another way to understand, hear, envision the universe that happened in this time, in the middle of making this book, um, really in, in large part to Kip's dedication and career. By the way, he didn't want to, <laughs> you didn't have any um, goal of mentioning that you won a Nobel Prize in this book. I had to make the paintings and say, can you write around this? Because I was like, I think it's going to be a little bit of an elephant in the room if we don't mention this tiny you know, award yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, well, a Nobel Prize, it should have gone to a team of a thousand people and that uh, 
regrettably, the uh, folks in Sweden insisted on giving to just three of us. But, and so that's what, what we tell the story about. And about this is that. why you drive around in a motorcycle jacket, because you're an icon, Kip. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I work at it with the motorcycle jacket. <laughs> and, and I work at it. Well, I don't work at it with you. I just, this just, uh, collaboration just comes naturally. It sure does. Okay. Well, yeah. speaking of collaboration and kind of picking up on this, this last point, you do a really wonderful job calling out, both calling out in text, but also in sort of capturing the visually the amount of people gesturing to the amount of people yes. that were involved, um, which is something that you know, as as a normie who's not in you know, I'm I'm not myself a theoretical physicist. I don't I'm not aware of all the different collaborators and the three decades that went into sort of making LIGO a success. I want to talk a little bit about the role of evocative communication, because both of you in your way kept through poetry and, and lineating your language through verse, and Leah through paintings, you're gesturing toward things that we, they're sort of um, known unknowns. It's, it's we're, we're getting into this territory where we have guesses, and, and Kip, you repeatedly sort of say, I don't know, I think so. Um, and the, the paintings are trying to visualize that, which is yeah. then even that much harder because you're kind of dancing between being tangible and again being evocative. So I'd love to hear about the decisions that you were both making, Kip in the language and Leah in the paintings, in realizing these highly complex ideas for a public audience. Mm -hmm. Well, from my point of view, a central feature of how my mind works, and also my dear friend Stephen Hawking, who is very similar, is that we both think geometrically and in terms of pictures. That's the only way that he could actually succeed in doing science since he lost the use of his hands back in about 1974. Uh, and, but for me, I th think when I'm doing serious scientific research, it's all motivated by pictures, by mental pictures. They give me the, uh, the t they are the tool for leaps of intuition to tell me what kind of calculation is worth doing, what kind of experiment might be worth doing uh, but as a, phys as a theoretical physicist, uh, the language of science is actually mathematics. But mathematics is a slow and arduous uh, process for the human mind, at least for my mind, to, to get to truth. But if I can have a huge leap of intuition through pictures, that then can motivate me to say this worth calculation is worth doing and those are not worth doing. Uh, and move forward that way. And so I'm all the time driven when I'm functioning as a physicist by pictures. And so it was really quite easy and natural to transfer, to, to feed to Leah ideas for pictures that would sort of correspond to what is going on in my own mind when I'm doing science. I mean, that's, that's fantastic to hear that even you need this sort of like pictorial breadcrumbs because I think for a, I never wanted to be an astronomer or a scientist, but I always was so, such a big part of my life of just curiosity about the natural world and sort of depicting it in some way. But when I was taking astronomy classes in college, I felt that there was something in mathematics that I couldn't like break through. And therefore, for me to understand something, it's almost like to understand it, I had to see it. I had to feel it. And with Kip, we found a way to have this back and forth. And um, by making many, many versions of the same thing, and in a weird way, the, you know, the book is not a little book, right? It's 260 pages, but it is actually, it is a little book in comparison to what was made versus the final product. Um, Adam and I counted on um, Tuesday, you'll love this, we're up to 668 paintings. We're still wow. going through like the final drawer and going through all the shelves of every, what it took to make this final 100 paintings. Um, but for me, that visualizing, that unseen, a lot of it was sort of depicting the things that you knew to know, okay, we can leave this out. This could be a little bit more this way. This could be bigger, the scale, the this, the feel, you know, all these things that are sort of outside of language that I would sort of do and kind of express and then iterate back to Kip. And Kip would say, no, a little bit more this way. And we just sort of 
and I, I really mean it feels like it's out of language because we just nudge it back and forth and sometimes it wasn't as directive as you'd think where Kip would you know, say, okay, this needs to be bigger. I don't think you ever gave me any direction like that, but it was always based on the experience of this thing and what the mathematics or the computer simulations were doing that would sort of help guide them, but it always came down to visualizing an experience. So how does the thing feel rather than what is the accurate description of the thing. But in, as, you, as you said, Jesse, uh, much of this uh, involves science where we're not completely sure how things behave, uh, what they're really like, but we have a pretty good idea because of our pretty good understanding of the, the relevant laws of physics, but not, not a full understanding. And so, uh, the, how it would, should actually be, I can't say for sure, but I know enough to be able to uh, suggest to Leah uh, doing a painting in some particular way, suggest very crudely, and then I would just tell her, use your imagination. Yeah. And so she uses her imagination, it comes out beautiful, except maybe something does, doesn't feel quite right. Uh, and it's not, not that it doesn't feel quite right because that violates the mathematics. It's because I am using intuition in areas where we're not completely sure what's going on. So it's more intuitive, yeah. uh, even in, in what I feed to Lisa or uh, to Leah. <laughs> there were many times where um, Kip would sort of give direction and I'd say, well, you know, what is that? What does that mean? And Kip would say, like, your paintings will show me. And I'm like, but what is gravitational foam? It's like, <laughs> we'll see once you paint it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of to that point, in doing research for this interview, and you brought up Stephen Hawking, um, uh, Sarah Howe, who's a poet, wrote uh, a poem for Stephen Hawking and then wrote an essay in the Paris Review recapping this sort of po process of you know, a similar type of thing of sort of adapting or transmuting these ideas. And she has um, a quote here that I, wanna, that I wanna read to you and sort of just see how it lands. Science relies on metaphor, traditionally the poet's tool, to describe and communicate itself. This was a recurring theme of my chats with scientific colleagues who in their teaching come up with analogies to explain complex ideas for their students or phenomena taking place at a level we can't see. They were conscious, too, of how these metaphors can mislead, making the known and the unknown seem more alike than they really are. No, I think that's very well said. Yeah. I think the one thing that is missing is that, and that I tried to emphasize before, is that, and at least for me, in doing scientific research, uh, the, the pictures and the metaphors are actual very, actually very powerful tools. Yeah. I'm aware that uh, they don't capture precisely how the mathematics goes, but if I, they're capturing it precisely, then that will slow me down to a crawl. <laughs> and so I need the metaphors and I need the pictures in order to have a leap of insight in order to decide what's worth doing and what's not. And uh, so I think people outside of science may not appreciate the extent to which at least some of us as scientists are using these same tools uh, in our actual work. Mm. And it may be that there's no way to know the whole thing, but by knowing fragments of the thing, you still know the thing. And so those tools are extremely powerful. But then you do have to go to the mathematics once you know the physical laws or you have a pretty good idea about them. You have to go to the mathematics in order to really test your ideas and your results. And you have to go to the experiments to get the ultimate verdict from nature as to whether you're on the right track or not. Mm. And uh, that is, in essence, is what we were doing while uh, Lee and I were writing the book, what my colleagues and I, my 1,000 colleagues and I, the, the fleet of 1,000 that uh, we refer to in the book, what we were doing uh, in the simulations and in the experimental work to really dig out from Einstein's laws and from uh, actually observing nature dig out how does the warp side of the universe behave. Mm. And Einstein also in doing research um, was actually very deft at creating thought, visual thought experiments mm -hmm. for understanding these phenomena at a time that we really had no idea and, and it, was, it was very difficult to measure any of this. It seems that there's this, um, this mode among physicists of 
using, like I think of um, quantum foam and string theory, of using these highly visual evocative terms to describe these, these unknowable, or not unknowable, but these currently unknowable concepts. Um, how, how are you thinking about the history of physicists using these metaphors from both a scientific and, and artistic standpoint? From a scientific standpoint, uh, Einstein, as you say, used these thought experiments uh, very powerfully, and I learned from Einstein. <laughs> and so, in fact, there is a the ch in chapter on wormholes here begins with explaining thought experiments and the extreme power of thought experiments. And thought experiments, for me, in this particular area, the most speculative of all the areas of the book, wormholes and time travel, thought experiments. Uh, were central to my research over a period of about uh, 10 years when I was really focusing on that. Uh, so, mm. yeah. I mean, for me, the thought experiment is, it ties into creating a transportive experience. Um, one of the chapters is called Leah's Time Machine Story, and that's because Kip told me something that m made my head hot, and I was like, but could it be like this? And I told him a story back using my wife Felicia as an example of how what he had told me worked. And therefore, for even that subtly without knowing what I was doing, for me to understand it, I was putting it into my own experience, right? Like, if you're abstracting it so much about what a wormhole, the, the interior physics of a wormhole, versus what would the wormhole do on your body? How could, it, how could it be? What could you do with it? All of a sudden, it's like, that's the way that I actually could understand it enough to then create a visualization of it. Do you feel like Felicia being the surrogate for the audience impacted how, obviously it impacted the art that you made, mm -hmm. but did it impact how you thought about the concepts? I mean, to me, it is so aligned with our goal of creating something that um, it wraps in a very sensual experience of excitement about this subject. I mean, for many years, not only did we call it our little book, but we, we also said, like, who would want this book? Only you and I. Like, I think that we set out to make, like, our, our dream book. Like, if I was to pick up a book about and read about black holes, it would have, you know, my favorite person in it. And it would be you know, I think also when you read the book, the way that Kip has written, you can tell that it's actually a conversation between Kip and I, him writing in Felicia and our friendship and our collaboration. It's it's not abstracted or um, it doesn't disappear or fall away in the book. It, it is actually a center core of the writing. And therefore, like that kind of... Um, you know, like personal intimacy and like sensual experience was just, it was so important for me. Uh, the using people that uh, are experiencing the warp side of the universe has always been central to me for communicating about the warp side of the universe. It was central in the movie Interstellar, uh, where the power of the father daughter interactions in the context of the warp side of the universe it really uh, makes that movie go in some deep sense. It uh, is central in my other science writing, but this is the first time it's been one, just one person, Felicia, and I think that, and, and this, this was really, I think, Leah's idea, uh, and I think it works superbly well that uh, this one person really is, as you say, a surrogate for the audience. This is funny because I remember it as your idea. <laughs> in the in the in the original Playboy, we had this um, painting. Do yeah. you remember this painting yes, of yeah. LIGO? And there were three people in yeah. front of it. And then um, when we ended up starting to make our little book, um, I I. I, maybe it was just, maybe the artwork, it, it did it itself, but at some point it was just that we knew that Felicia was going to be the central um, character. And for me, that, you know, it made me so excited to have, like, um, think of it as, like, embodied in this one centralized person. It became super personal in the same way, it, 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 very vulnerable, right? Like, in the same way that Kip decides 
Um, he sees the paintings next to his writing, and he said, oh my gosh, it could be poetry. It felt like the equal match of the artwork than for me to be painting, you know, Felicia. Also in doing research for this interview, um, I was reminded of um, Tracy K. Smith's uh, My God, It's Full of Stars. It's a poem. Um, it's a very long, uh, beautiful poem that kind of interconnects with um, a lot of ideas um, even outside of science in particular, I recommend everybody read this poem. Um, but there's a snippet that really struck me that correlates to some of what you're getting into in the warp side of our universe. Perhaps the greatest error is believing we're alone, that the others have come and gone, a momentary blip, when all along space might be chock full of traffic, bursting at the seams with energy we neither feel nor see, flush against us, living, dying, deciding. Could you talk a little bit about wormholes? Gravity, <laughs> time, time travel. I would love to. I would love to launch into this. I know that this is probably like. I'm gonna go grab of, lunch. I'm yeah. gonna like Kim take this. And I'll be back. <laughs> what do you think? Kim? Well, let me just tell a story. <laughs> How did I get into this? I, when I was a student a, at Princeton, I went to Princeton to uh, work with John Wheeler, who was the great guru of relativity of that era. And it was in an era when uh, we had the possibility of black holes and wormholes, two kinds of objects, well, as well as gravitational waves that exist on what now I now call the warped side of the universe. And uh, Wheeler was quite convinced that wormholes uh, really play an important role in our universe. But the black holes uh, are sort of anathema. There's no way that you could have a black hole because hmm. uh, it has this singularity down at the center. And, Singularities are, uh, are surely cannot occur in the in the real universe, and uh, and so he was just in the process of being uh, of being forced uh, by growing evidence to turn around on black holes, and and he turned around and he even named the black hole uh, once he turned around. So that was that was the uh, venue in, in which I uh, was existing. At the same time. Uh, wormholes sort of dropped to the side. They, uh, it, we had no evidence they existed, but we were beginning to see evidence that there really are black holes. Then, of course, Carl Sagan phones me up one day and he says, uh, I have this uh, book that I'm working on, an associated script for a movie called Contact, and uh, I have my uh, heroine traveling uh, to near the Star Vega through a black hole, and I know I might be in trouble, and can you help me? <laughs> and, uh, so I, and so I told him, this, this is about 1984, I think, and I told him, uh, uh, well, I don't think you you're not, can't get through a black hole to the Star Vega, but you, if wormholes could exist, you can get through a wormhole. And that's what suddenly triggered me to start thinking seriously about wormholes, which had become sort of defunct in physicist thinkings. Uh, they'd become defunct be also because John Wheeler, together with Martin Kruskal, a colleague of his, of his had uh, shown mathematically that uh, if you have a wormhole left to its own devices, it will collapse and you'll never be able to go through. And so the whole issue of how you hold a wormhole open, uh, well, people weren't even thinking about that. They just accepted that the wormhole collapses, period, and that's that. And uh, so it was at that point I began asking these questions about whether or not a wormhole can be held open uh, and for, for example, uh, uh, use by ultra-advanced civilization. I recognized we were in a domain where we, it is so far beyond our technology of doing experiments that it would, it would re be ridiculous to even think about experiments. And so we had to go to thought experiments in order to explore what our laws of physics say about this and, uh, uh, and what the poorly understood laws of quantum gravity say about this. So this is what drove me into what becomes in this book, the chapter about wormholes and time travel. But it was, that, that's, that's the historical background of where it comes from. And so it was through thought experiments uh, and uh, through stimulating colleagues who had more time to think about this than I did because this was happening just as LIGO was starting to take off, and I was not going to be able to stay working on wormholes and try and travel very long because I was going to have to really focus on LIGO to help help 
my experimentalist friends uh, make that succeed. And so it was through that that I did stimulate colleagues to start thinking about these issues very seriously. And uh, so the things in here are the re tentative results by colleagues of mine, some by me and my students, that all grew out basically of this, this story of Carl Sagan saying, uh, I want my heroine to go through a black hole and uh, <laughs> help me, please. She will get there in one piece. <laughs> yeah. She will not get there in one piece if she uses a black hole. Yeah. Looking at this from an artistic standpoint, Leah, I, I loved how like three quarters of the way through we get red. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, we're really dealing with white and blue. Yep. Um, so there's a question in there about how you thought about negative space. And there's a question in there also about process of how you use so many different, um, you get so much depth out of that blue that it communicates a z-axis in many cases where you wouldn't imagine that that would be possible with when you've constrained to those to that minimal color palette. So yeah, talk to me about that, that minimalism, that color palette, those decisions. Yeah, I really love working in the kind of lowest lowest denomination of how you can create a painting that sits on the edge of something that can be abstracted based on the materiality, right? You're looking at some of these paintings and you are like, it's a black hole. And then really quickly, you're like, it's a puddle of ink. And it goes back and forth between being the thing and then describing something else. And especially with Kip distilling his words into poetry, I wanted to keep the paintings as simple and elegant as possible um, so that they would sort of have this power to sort of, like, they could translate big things, but do it in a way that was like, you. It, there was no bells and whistles. It wasn't, there wasn't a lot of color. There wasn't, I mean, I, I make all sorts of things from videos to paintings, oil paintings, prints, but this would be a way that it was like the most simple form of visual communication, but that it would, um, it would do so much heavy lifting just through the elegance of the material itself. And the things are painted on um, drafting film, which is almost like a plastic infused paper. And what I love about that actually is the difficulty it is to work with this material because um, the ink can't, unlike a watercolor or an oil paint, the ink can't soak into the paper. What happens is it moves fluidly on top of the kind of plastic-esque uh, surface. Um, it's like um, film-like. And then the um, the water just evaporates. So you get these gorgeous pools of inks that um, kind of take on a life of its own. So in many times, the iterations or the multiple making of the same thing, um, I would do the painting sort of rather quickly, see what the ink was doing, and then that sometimes the ink would determine whether or not the painting was selected as like a final or I needed to make um, many other ones. The use of red was probably a conversation that we had. I Brett think Leeds. I forced you into it. <laughs> I was going to use a more gentle sentence, but I'm really glad you said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we talked about it for nearly a year. Um, and I'm really happy that we actually ended up, I've never even told you that, but I am really happy we did it. Why? Well, I, I, you, yes, I agree, I, okay, I, I, fine. I, I, <laughs> Finally, after 13 years, I wanna say you were right. <laughs> um, okay, this is why. Um, there's parts of the book that really lean on the sense of experience, right? The, the, pa the paintings, especially of F Felicia, are meant to be, they, they don't make sense in scale, but they make sense in this like really sensual way of the body. And I'm thinking of the figure and, and the movement of the fluid, the fluid of the ink, and also like the vortices or spinning or something, you know, that ha it's more about the experience of the painting. There's certain passages that are very, very specifically in, in a very powerful way need to translate the complexities of Kip's science that are being done with computer simulations. And if you think about how to parallel, how do you make like a simple ink painting from something as complex of the mathematics that are being done in computer simulation where you have... Um, you know, a, a visual in time and all different colors and all, it, like there's so many different ways that that does a lot more. But I think the th key thing in the physics is that there is in 
here, as in many other places in physics, there is a duality that occurs. That uh, there is a phenomenon that has precisely two sides. Uh, gravity waves stretch and they squeeze. That's all they do. They stretch and they squeeze, but they're just two things. Uh, st sticking out of a black hole, there is a counterclockwise vortex of twisting space at the North Pole and a clockwise vortex of twisting space at the South Pole. There, it's, it's like if you take a wet towel and you try to wring uh, the water out of the towel. If you think about it, if your right hand sees your left hand going counterclockwise, then your left hand will see your right hand going counterclockwise. So it's a, actually it's a property of the twist. And this duality, this, this two-sided nature of the physics was something that to me it was very important to be able to bring it out uh, in the paintings in a compelling way, uh, just as it a, has a compelling role in the verse and in the science. And that's why I pushed her so hard. I mean, there's many paintings where we would look at what I thought was a done painting, and you know, he'd say, "But Felicia's head needs to be going clockwise, and her feet are going <laughs> counterclockwise." And you know, and to do that with one color is gets to be challenging in a certain way. So we came up with this, um, you know, agreement, uh, which again I do think is the <laughs> right one, um, where that in certain paintings, I don't even know how many there are, but it must be maybe 5% of the book. It's just a handful of them. Certainly no more than five. Yeah, yeah, and so to me, those lean more along the line of the didactic, but in a way, it's just so simple, right? The blue has a little bit of teal. It has a little bit of something that is actually um, evokes the universe, but it is not of the universe. And then the red, if you look really carefully, you know, is not actually like a red red, it's an orange red. So it has this kind of you just know that it has this um, opposing kind of sensibility, these like green blues and these orange reds that have a relationship that even if you didn't know clockwise, counterclockwise, um, stretch, squeeze, you would know that they're, they just naturally, the colors create that conversation. So the, that decision worked also with, again, this how can the material translate the subject in the most simple way without you knowing anything? Mm. I also really appreciated how, of course, every, everything on Earth we do is dependent on gravity, but more so even than normal art making, it's dependent on gravity because the ink is kind of going where it wants to go. So there's like this form and function thing, um, which maybe is like too obvious and I'm not meaning to, to you know. Uh, no, I, I think I, it's great. I was <laughs> like, as you're saying it, I'm like, I've never thought of that. So I don't think it's that. I, I mean, I, I love that it sort of takes on a life of its own. And I do think that it's nice that I don't have total control, mm. right? I like that the material sort of pushes back and it says something about you know, the way that I'm making it in a way that, I don't know, it keeps me on my toes. I can't, you know, I can never totally master it. It's, it's always going to give me trouble. And I love that. Mm. And Kip, in the book, um, you reference, you, there's this moment where um, Galileo is looking at uh, the moons of Jupiter, I believe, uh, through the telescope. And you use that to sort of capture how much has changed in the several hundred years since uh, the discovery of electro electromagnetic waves. And now we're at the beginning of understanding that there even are gravity waves. Could you talk a little bit about what's special about gravity waves? Um, maybe get into a little bit of, um, I, I, I know that this is sort of a can of worms question as it relates to LIGO, but sort of the, the mechanism by which you detected those waves and some of what you're thinking about us discovering looking into the future. Mm -hmm. Well, the essence of gravity waves is discovered by Einstein in the mathematics of relativity, once he had the, uh, the laws of relativity that he discovered. Uh, gravity waves stretch and squeeze space. So the gravity wave is moving from you to me. Uh, it, uh, it perpendicular to its motion. It's stretching space along this direction when squeezing space along that direction. Then it oscillates, stretches this direction, squeezes that direction. And so uh, it was Ray Weiss, my dear, my transcontinental soulmate, <laughs> as I call him in the verse, uh, this very dear friend who uh, conceived the idea of this gravitational wave detector that ultimately succeeded in seeing these waves, uh, who uh, said, well, we will build an instrument uh, that, uh, in which you have 
and it mirrors hanging from overhead supports. And when space is stretched along this direction, they will move apart. The distance between them will increase. And when it's squeezed along the other direction, they'll move together. And we will measure that using laser interferometry, using a technique with light called interferometry, which is a very, very powerful way to measure differences between the lengths of things in two directions. And so he invented this scheme back in 1972 uh, and that ultimately succeeded. Uh, as I describe in the verse, uh, uh, I thought he was crazy because the numbers just didn't seem to work out. That He wanted to make measurements that were 10 million times smaller than the, uh, the he was going to bounce light off of a mirror. Uh, the mirror is rough because it's made of atoms. And the uh, motion of the mirror caused by the gravity waves, I was pretty sure, based as an astrophysicist, based on my understanding of the universe, that motion would be 10 million times smaller than the individual atoms inside that mirror. And I, I, come on, Rick, <laughs> you've gone crazy. And uh, he ultimately convinced me that we had a shot. And so that, that is the, the end point of the story is what was going on when uh, Leah and I were working on the book was that, uh, that uh, he and I and Ron Drever, whom we brought from Glasgow, Scotland, had put together this LIGO collaboration at Caltech and MIT to do this. We had brought on a guy named Barry Barrage, who was absolutely superb in, uh, organ in seeing how to organize something that's very complex and make it happen at a feasible cost. The feasible cost wound up being a billion dollars of taxpayer money. But still, to do what Galileo did for astronomy, but doing it in this era, opening up the other window onto the universe, the electromagnetic window that Galileo opened up with instruments, we have opened up the gravitational wave window. And it's just taking off the, the enormous uh, new development since 2015 when we saw the first gravitational waves. So this is sort of the essence of much of what's going on inside this book. And uh, this, the story of this is only toward the end of uh, the writing process, uh, process that I got pushed into telling the story of how we did this. And, and, and as you mentioned earlier in our discussion, the, the Nobel Prize business that I, I got pushed into telling. But I do realize now, it, I've always felt uncomfortable being an icon, uh, which I have become. It makes me very uncomfortable, but I, I've come to realize that uh, icons are useful. I may as well be useful. And, uh, and, and so in this, in this book, we do tell the story of how I and Barry and Ray became icons. I mean, there's a really amazing book by one of our very favorite people, Jan Eleven, um, called Black Hole Blues. And in all the time that I've known Kip and known the story, uh, you know, when we started working on this, LIGO hadn't discovered gravitational waves, and I kind of know little parts of the history, but this book does an extraordinary job of taking this you know initial collaboration i mean think of how extraordinary it is um that at the time that kip and ray are thinking of these things a lot of the science community didn't really understand even what black holes are and then they're going and petitioning mm -hmm. to congress to create the most expensive detector scientific machine made in the United States. Um, it's a really extraordinary, um, you know, it's an extraordinary journey of thousands of people. One thing I didn't, I was completely unaware of um, is the communicative capacity of gravity waves. Could you share a little bit about what we can actually learn from gravity? Well, because gravity, because gravity waves are made from warped space and time, they're a stretching and squeezing of space as time passes. They are the ideal tool for exploring the warped side of the universe, exploring black holes, wormholes, the Big Bang singularity, as we call it, in which the universe was born. Uh, and those are aspects of the universe that we can't see with electromagnetic waves. Uh, and so, uh, Gravity waves are then the key to 
discovering this whole other shadow universe that we call the warp, that I like to call the warp side. Uh, and they are beginning to, to reveal details of it. Uh, uh, but then there are interactions between that shadow universe, the warp side, and, our, uh, and the, uh, the material side that we live on. Uh, there are objects called neutron stars that are made from both, partly from warp space time, strong warping, uh, and from atomic nuclei squeezed side by side. And uh, we and LIGO, together with our European colleagues in the Virgo project, uh, that was similar to the LIGO project, just came along a little bit later. Uh, we've seen gravitational waves from colliding neutron stars and seen thereby the interactions between these two sides of the universe and discovered, for example, we, I should say my colleagues, my, these thousands of colleagues, well, a quarter of all of the world's astronomers observed this collision with uh, every kind of uh, electromagnetic and gravitational wave telescope that exists. So it was a fabulous thing uh, on uh, August 17, 2017. Uh, and uh, the, uh, those observations told us, for example, that uh, almost all of the gold and platinum in our universe was made when neutron stars collide and force the fusion of less heavy atomic nuclei together to make the gold and the platinum. So, I mean, we've been learning marvelous things from these observations, and particularly now from the beginning of multi-messenger astronomy, the combining the electromagnetic observations with the gravitational waves. In those cases, when you're dealing with both the warp side of the material and the material side working together, with black holes, you, you see only the gravitational waves. And we would have no idea about that without, without the gravitational waves. Mm. And just from my own curiosity, what, what was your decision making around calling it the warp side of our universe? It's a phrase that, uh, I, I have, for, for, for decades, I have used the word warp space time, whereas the technical phrase that Einstein used and that caught on and that my colleagues still generally use is curved space time. Somehow the idea of curved space and time doesn't capture nearly as evocatively or as clearly what's going on as warp space time. And so I've insisted on using this phrase, even though it makes some of my colleagues feel a little uncomfortable. I, I don't quite know why. Uh, and uh, then calling it the warped side of the universe, well, that's pretty obvious. Uh, people do talk about the dark side of the universe, dark matter and dark energy. Uh, and uh, it really is quite, I mean, it's a, it is a, well, let me back up and tell you another little historical tidbit. John Wheeler, who was my mentor, uh, also a mentor to my uh, dear friend Richard Feynman at Caltech, who's uh, better known than I am. Uh, John uh, realized when he was very young as a scientist the power of the words we use in uh, stimulating and motivating uh, how people think about, how people the general public, but also how scientists think about things. So he put a lot of effort into conceiving the phrase black hole, which caught on, when he started using it, just caught on completely and took over. And it completely transformed how we think about these objects. Before that, they were uh, called gravitationally collapsed stars. Yeah. Not, not as much of a ring to not, it. doesn't not have quite the ring. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it doesn't capture the essence of it. Well, similarly, for me, this is my attempt to emulate my mentor. For me, the warp side of the universe captures very powerfully what's really going on here, uh, just as Johnny Wheeler's uh, black hole captured that. Mm. When I think about it, it just, it the warp side, it sort of invites a kind of, um, reading that's like weird and wild and like, you know, it's sort of the adventurous unknown and, um, you know, it's, it, 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 it encompasses the spirit of the book in such an incredible way that it, um, because it, it just is like far reaching. It's all of the things. Mm. I want to ask both of you basically 
what your influence is in or interest with the, um, let's say, the mirror image of your subject matter expertise. So in Kip, your case, what were early interests of yours with poetry, storytelling, um, art? And Leah, for you, what were early interests you had in science and exploration and mathematics mm -hmm. that have caused both of you to kind of end up kind of almost like <laughs> helixing back to do this project? Yeah. So uh, when I was very young, very young, uh, probably beginning about eight or 10 years old, I started to read the poetry of Robert Service. And I partic was particularly enamored of the cremation of Sam McGee uh, but also other poetry. Beyond that, uh, my father had a book that he loved, The 101 Great Poems, published back near the beginning of the 20th century, uh, that uh, I, is a treasured property of me now that my father has passed away many decades ago. And I used to just thumb through that and really enjoy the poetry. I had a paper out when I was a kid. Uh, I had various jobs, but on the paper out, uh, I would sometimes uh, spend my time trying to memorize poems. Uh, the uh, Ride of Paul Revere, Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, and Cremation of Sam McGee. That was one way to keep my mind occupied while I was uh, bicycling around Logan, Utah, uh, throwing papers. So poetry was important to me just as a private thing uh, at that time. Um, the I, My mother, uh, wanted her children to be immersed in a world of art. And so she uh, would collect uh, prints of great art, and she would put them on the kitchen wall for us to see, and she would change them uh, after about a month. And uh, through the whole time I was growing up, we saw uh, Venus on the half shell and uh, various other uh, paintings that uh, uh, that uh, and, and she would tell us about about the paintings. So I was immersed in art in, in that sense. When I went to Caltech as a freshman, uh, it was the last year in the, uh, that they had as a requirement, every freshman must take engineering drawing. And so that was the first time I actually really put a, a big effort into doing something that was artistic, it was engineering drawing, yes, but I learned a, a lot about perspective. I took to it really well. And in fact, through my whole career then, I did my own uh, drawings. In the book, The Science of Interstellar, there are huge numbers of hand-drawn uh, uh, pictures that I did uh, for that, uh, The Science of Interstellar. So that's what I brought to the table. Uh, I don't know whether Lee even knows all of this, but uh, no. that's what I brought to the table. I didn't know that you had that some of the drawings in the Science of Interstellar were yours. And a most shocking to me is that you had a paper out because I had a paper out, so we were meant to be with PFS <laughs> this entire time. Yeah. Um, but uh, some of the things that I love the most are that we have several drawings where we're drawing back and forth on the same page where Kip would make his marks on top of my paintings. And that that to me is really... Like, it's so lovely because it is the way that we are communicating. We're kind of meeting in the middle in this, like, visual domain. But I was so embarrassed about how bad my drawings were that I didn't try to make them really good because I knew if I tried to make them really good, they would still totally pale compared to yours. <laughs> Um, my origins of science come from my, um, similar to, to Kip, is through my parents. My father is a um, biophysicist and biochemist, and um, he didn't try to push me into science in any way, but just Gosh, from the from every moment of my childhood, he just instilled such a love of curiosity and asking questions and figuring something out. And I think the biggest gift was that science was never a scary space or a space that was off limits. My dad made me feel like I could figure anything out if I wanted to. And um, you know, he's he's an experimental scientist, so he actually had a laboratory. So from when I was five years old, he would do this really sweet thing and say, gosh, I really need help in my lab. I'm overwhelmed with work. Do you think you would 
like, do you think you would want to get out of kindergarten and help me? And I would be like, oh, well, if you really need the help, you know. <laughs> but he did this thing where he would bring me into his space and make me feel needed and invited. And I just, that became like a familiar space. Um, and then one of the biggest influences on my entire studio practice, maybe more than undergrad and grad school, was my first job at 15 years old uh, doing cow eye dissections and laser demonstrations and demonstrations about magnets at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. They have this amazing summer job uh, for 15-year-olds, and you just kind of walk around to the general public to this incredible museum of 9,000 exhibits in San Francisco um, that everything is hands-on. You just walk around to the public and say, hey, do you want to learn about this weird thing? Um, but what they're doing is that at the start of every shift, you have a group um, of 40 kids, and they're all learning something. And then you take it and you go and explain the rest of the day. And by the end of the summer, I was like, I never want to leave this place. And I got hired in the machine shop um, and mentored under an incredible designer, Tom Tompkins. Um, and he just got me to build everything. I was on like a lathe, a sandblaster, an end mill. You know, it, now it's like a year later. It's like six, I'm 16 years old and I'm you know, cutting blocks of metal to a hundredth of an inch for a knob that he needs for, you know, some, um, you know, experiment and some, um, uh, you know, part of the museum exhibit that he needs. And that those two experiences of just such a warm environment from my family, always encouraging me in art and, um, you know, creativity, whether that's in science or otherwise, and then having this tangible, hands-on, um, you know, way of understanding things, that solidified for me. Now looking back, I don't think I was aware of it then, because I was always like, oh, this is my weekend job, and I'm going to go be an artist. And then, um, you know, that just carried with me that really my passion as an artist is to communicate this you know, curiosity about the natural world in large scales that we may never, you know, have a um, understanding of, wormholes, black holes, you know, theoretical physics, and also things like, you know, I've made work about, you know, crystals and skateboarding and, you know, all sorts of things that, you know, flow through my, um, my experience in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's another very interesting connection here. The Exploratorium was the brainchild, the creation of Frank Oppenheimer, who was the brother of J. Robert Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. after whom I pandered how I mentored my students through my whole career, after whom I pandered this, the sociological structure of my research group meetings, whom I knew uh, fairly well when I was a graduate student. And he was at, at Princeton. He was the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and who both uh, Robert and Frank are central people in the Oppenheimer film that uh, just came out a few months ago. It's, uh, it's really interesting, the connection between Frank yeah. and, uh, and Robert and you and me. Well, it's interesting because the Exploratorium is like, if I was to have a, <clears throat> if I was to think of a model that I have for my studio practice, you know, like looking around, sometimes I think it's almost like there's three to four people working in here mm -hmm. because there's, <clears throat> an ink painting, I'm working on a book, then I'm working on a video, then there's oil paintings, then there's a cyanotype, then there's this other experiment. You know, it's like, I just feel like a passion for this kind of open-ended building, even if you're not, you can always be making something that you have a deadline on, but you should always be prototyping, <laughs> should always be like thinking of this other way of doing something. And so, um, <clears throat> That space that he built at the Exploratorium, it was a concept more than it was a physical space. And the people that f helped him found that museum speak of him in that way, that he's creating the way that we engage in science as much as it is like, you know, a model for like a museum experience, which now has been duplicated and mimicked and ripped off multiple ways. It's the Exploratorium that was you know, founded in the 70s is, is actually much more akin to what our museum experience is now, right? Where there's like a thing that you can take away and touch and feel, you know, now we understand that is a great way to learn. But the Exploratorium was really, um, it was that bridge of art and science to create that experience made tangible. Mm. In thinking about, you know, the Exploratorium, 
your summer work. Like, there's also a thread that comes up for me around communicating with the public and making invitations to the public, yeah. which both of you have done in your respective practices, and you're, of course, very much doing in this book. Why? Why is that important to you? Yeah, I keep telling Kip he's doing a pretty poor job of being a retired person. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, why? I just changed careers. That's <laughs> yeah, all. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, communicating to the public has always been important to me. Uh, it's, uh, it, and I think it, some of this came from John Wheeler, my mentor. I co authored a textbook with him and Charlie Misner uh, that, uh, about a textbook on relativity. The title of the textbook was Gravitation that uh, turned out to be tremendously influential. And for John wrote for the dedication of the book at the very front that we dedicate this book to our fellow citizens. I don't remember the full details, but it, our fellow citizens who give both financially uh, to the government, which funds the science that we do, but they also send their children to our universities uh, to be stimulated and to learn about science, and some of them become scientists, and they carry on after us uh, the, legacy, the legacy that we have uh, tried to lay out. And uh, I felt that very strongly from John as his student, uh, but I also got some of that from my parents. My father was a, a scientist. And so it was part of my career from the very, very beginning. And uh, I made a decision when I decided it was time to retire that I would gradually transition to a, that was 2009, so we're now uh, 14 years away from that. And I would make a transition in those subsequent years uh, to uh, a career at the interface between the arts and the science, both because it would be fun and because it would be a powerful way to further communicate about science uh, to the non-scientists. For me, my experience of art that was really impactful was seeing art, seeing art in museums when I was little. And I just think that um, having access to my work that most of the art world is sort of contained in this weird way to galleries, and it's in a way just an elite game. In a lot of ways, my the paintings that I make, if they go off to fantastic homes, I'll actually never see them again. And so it's really important that I seek out projects that have a larger reach. Um, and whether that's this book or projects that are open to the public, I also think of teaching as an extension of this. Um, teaching has been, like Kip, it really impactful in my career. A lot of times uh, when I'm thinking about something and making a project about it, I'll then write a class about it. So a good example of that is I started learning to fly a plane, and so I wrote a class called Up, and um, it was a it was a wonderful experience because I'm like, everyone is fascinated with it, what it means to be unbounded from the earth. And I co-taught it with uh, an amazing poet, Anna Leahy, and a, <clears throat> and a designer, Claudine Johannesson. And we took this one core subject and then we just looked at it from our own disciplines. And that just gave me so much more of an expanse to have this outside perspective. So I think that making art that stays within the art world can be quite a bit of an echo chamber and that my like drive is a larger kind of scope of communication. On the note of uh, flying, <clears throat> uh, I hear that you and Kip's wife Carolee did ground school together. <laughs> I had always wanted to learn how to fly a plane. I had taken a couple of lessons before, and I think we were out to dinner, and Carol Lee said, let's just do it. Let's just sign up for uh, and take flying lessons together. And so we took ground school together, and then we had the same instructor um, through the Caltech JPL Flying Club. And um, yeah, I think it was like, to be able to do it with Carolee or just having, it seems like so impossible. And then all you need to do is just sign up and have a friend say, if you're gonna do it, I'll do it too. And uh, do you and Felicia all fly together? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we, I, Felicia doesn't care for flying. Yeah, and I don't think you do either. <laughs> well, 
It's a mixed bag. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, no, I, uh, I was always a little afraid of, uh, of uh, crashes. I, I, I've, because of the nature of my career, I do risk analysis on anything that's risky. <laughs> and I could never get the numbers to do a realistic risk, risk analysis on, the, on this uh, private flying of these small airplanes. And so that's made me ever so much more nervous about this thing. And when but I, but th th these guys just didn't seem to have any, oh, uh, yeah. any we concern. Were, I mean... They loved it so much that I figured it was worth the risk, even though I didn't know just how much the risk was and couldn't qu quantify it. I was convinced that Felicia would think this was like an amazing idea. I was like, we could fly to San Diego or Santa Barbara for lunch. And um, when, when Carol, and I, Carol Lee and I first started flying, it was like this thing that we'd go around in the pattern and do touch and goes. And after a couple of months, I convinced Felicia to come. I was so excited. I was like, you can sit and watch me fly the plane around. And we're walking up to the plane that um, I had done my check off and I actually had keys to the plane. So I'm like thinking I'm so super cool. We're walking up to the plane and I and Felicia's sort of off my shoulder and she starts laughing and she starts laughing harder and harder. And I turn around and she's laughing so hard. She has like physical tears coming down. She's like barely able to talk. And I'm like, what is so funny? This is as we're approaching the plane that I've been flying all these months. And she goes, this is the plane that you've been flying? Because it's a Cessna 172. It weighs 1,400 pounds. It's a you know Volkswagen Bug with wings. And she looks at it and she goes, there is no fucking way I'm ever getting in that thing. I think in her mind, she thought I was like flying Kardashian jets around. <laughs> and even that was not really something she wanted to get involved with. And then she, when she saw that it was a Cessna. She said that the way that she would do it is number one, there would be wine in the back, and number two, if she would go with Kip. So <laughs> that was how we got Kip and, and Felicia to get in the planes. Is that they said that they could, they would do it if they flew together. Wonderful. I have um, three questions that I like to ask guests. Um, they're sort of recurring questions. You've kind of hit on them already, so feel free to repeat yourself. Um, but also if there's other examples that you think fit the bill, uh, feel free to take that away. Um, what's one thing you wish people paid more attention to? I wish people would pay more attention to the fact that we all make mistakes. We all make lots of mistakes. Uh, and that uh, making mistakes is part of the process of coming to uh, perfect uh, whatever you're trying to do. Uh, as a scientist, I get my nose rubbed into it every day, uh, several times, sometimes many times when I make mistakes and I see the mistake and I correct the mistake. I wish that politicians would get their nose rubbed into it <laughs> and confess their mistakes and recognize that that's the way the world works. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I would say something I wish people would, would know a little more is is that through like a dead, like if you show up enough and you're curious enough that you can get a lot farther than you think you can get. I think that there's certain subjects and this is a good example of science that a lot of people feel like it's not theirs anymore, that they can't ask questions, that they don't belong, that it's not their, um, they're not good enough or know enough to participate. And if you use the analogy like a sunset, no one would say that they couldn't participate in a sunset. So how is that any different from something as exciting, like the warp side of the universe, black holes, wormholes? Um, but I think in general, just I would say, show up, ask questions. You can get a lot further than you think you can. And what is one resource that you would recommend for making better sense of reality? <laughs> I would answer that your own body, um, that I've, I've found um, through just paying a little bit more attention and being aware of your senses, and there's all different ways to do that, whether it's meditating. Um, I have two small kids, and two years old and five years old, and I am almost like on a day-to-day on a -day basis shocked how they pull me into reality, and I just, 
into noticing and being aware of what's happening around us. I think the, the kind of distractions, whether that's the obvious things about your phone or even just your own mind, but just being aware of what's happening in the present moment, a kind of mindfulness. Mm. Most powerful way that I know for people to get some sense of how the universe around us works is to observe it carefully. Rainbows, uh, water waves, things of everyday experience. And then go browse the web and uh, search for information about why is it this way? What, what is it that makes it do that? Uh, the web is a wonderful resource if you ask the right questions. And so just tie those questions to the observations that you make. Mm. I love these answers. So the final one, what's one moment where your sense of reality was disrupted? Oh, I know exactly, right away. Um, it's observing a total solar eclipse. The reason it was one of the most awe-inspiring moments for me was because I thought I knew so much about it. So it's something that you can read about, you can get stories, people, obviously, you know, this is not like an, a new experience that um, you're having. And both Kip and I traveled to, not together, but we were both in Oregon for the 2017. I was as well. Oh, amazing. Yeah. For the total solar eclipse. And I just felt like it was so outside of language that it still <laughs> feels shocking. I mean, there's very few things that I've experienced in my life that stand out to me. It's like <clears throat> soloing a plane for the first time, being like, I'm alone and I'm flying. Watching my daughter be born, and a Eclipse is right up there in the top three, where it just, it, it just transformed a way where I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't understand reality. What is, I mean, every part about me, my senses, visual, like the, the temperature, the sounds, everything just seemed to um, turn it on its upside down. So go to the solar eclipse, total solar eclipse in August of 2024, back to Texas, <laughs> or uh, April of 2024. <clears throat> yeah. So as a physicist, it had seemed obvious to me right from the beginnings of my studies of relativity and uh, the studies of history of science, histories of our understanding of the universe, it seemed obvious to me our universe is expanding, but gravity is trying to slow that expansion down. And so the universe is expanding, but the expansion gets slower and slower and slower. And this was just obvious. The mathematics made it absolutely clear Yes, uh, Einstein at one point had invented something called the cosmological constant, which modified his theory of gravity so that it could uh, turn around and start to accelerate. But that was uh, the ugliest uh, kludge I had ever seen in the math law mathematical laws of physics. It just There's no way that, that that could possibly be. Who ordered that? No way, no <laughs> way that nature would, would implement that. He, 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 he uh, did that, I think, in a, mo a moment of, of uh, sudden lack of confidence. Then some observations came in from colleagues that said the universe is starting to accelerate its expansion. I said, no, that can't possibly be. <laughs> uh, astronomers have so many errors in their observations that they don't really understand. And we've seen so frequently in, in the past history them thinking they've discovered something and then they're wrong. And uh, so uh, that can't be true. And then a piece of observation came in from another direction saying the universe is accelerating the expansion. I said, no, no, no way, not, pos not possible. When the third piece of information <laughs> came in, I threw in the towel and it was a shock. And so the whole process is this, uh, what does this is called dark energy, but dark energy is just a name for something we don't understand. But, but the discovery of, quote, dark energy, really the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe, shook the foundations of physics for me. It's wonderful in the sense that uh, whenever there is something that you really are convinced for very good reason is true as a scientist, and then it turns out not to be true, that is going to have a huge impact on 
uh, our understanding of the very fundamentals, and that's what is going on here. <laughs> but the struggle with understanding that is, is still going on. But that is another example of uh, admitting your mistake. It took me a long time. It took me three independent observations to throw in the towel. That's not an area I was working in, but it was an area where I understood the theory very deeply. And as a theorist, I couldn't believe it. Mm. Yeah, I believe it was Beckett who said, fail better, which I think is a good adage to live by. Yeah. Yeah. This book is out on Halloween. October 31st. Can you share a little bit about, um, are there any uh, readings people should be aware of, any any other associated um, information or places to find uh, that information about the book? Well, we have a lot of fantastic public events coming up in, on the East Coast. We'll be at Harvard and at Pioneer Works, and you can um, look those up on my website if you just use the internet and my first and last name. Um, and then in here in Los Angeles, there'll be a solo show of the artwork, of a selection of the artwork in the book at um, my gallery, Luis de Jesus, Los Angeles. That opens November 4th. And then we have an event um, with Caltech on November 13th and uh, Griffith, Griffith Observatory. Observatory on December 14th for all spaces considered. There will be a, a large spread in the New York Times science section about the book sometime in the next few weeks. We don't know precisely when. Uh, and and other, uh, other articles and uh, feature stories about the book elsewhere in the media. But uh, that's... The, the, the media aspect of it has not quite begun yet, but we, we're aware that it's uh, getting underway. Mm. You're very early, Jesse. You're <laughs> getting us at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm honored to have been able to. Uh, this is a really tremendous book, um, and I'm really excited for people to start reading it. Thank you both so much for being on the Reality Studies podcast. Thank you so Thank much you. for having us. This was a blast. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. This podcast is edited and produced by Adam Labrie and me, Jesse Damiani. Adam Labrie also directed, shot, and edited the video version of the podcast, which is available on YouTube. Music is by Eaters, sound effects by Eric Medias at soundimage.org. For more information, please visit realitystudies.co. And if you appreciate the work I'm doing, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing it. Until next time. <laughs>